it is okay to do a walls or fertile greenery for aesthetic reasons, but you have to make sure the green walls adds value to the environment. So you got to go in with your eyes open. Exactly. An outstanding practitioner in landscape architecture, Leonard Ng is the country market director for Henning Larson. Deemed Designer of the Year 2023 by the prestigious President's Design Award Singapore. He is the brainchild behind some of Singapore's most celebrated green public spaces. Designing for nature is not like designing for a building. I'm not actually designed for the moment it opens. I'm designing for when trees and the plants and the ecosystem has matured. Providing spaces for greenery has now become more fashionable and came about because of climate change. The application maybe has really miss this big picture. The success of the green wall is actually very much dependent on. So when it fails, it is an absolute disaster. Here's another big problem. It's got a huge maintenance issue. Does it cost more? And if so, how much? How do we deal with pests? Do you think public money should subsidize greenery? Wow, that is a provocative question. Let me take a firm stand on this. Previously, 10 years ago, this was not even part of the discussion. And if you're not talking about it, you cannot be solving it. There's a lot of awareness. People are trying to collaborate and have a shared vision towards uh, building a sustainable, livable cities. And have you aspired to be a livable, biophilic city in balance with nature? Then you need Welcome to EcoGradia, where we meet experts and practitioners at the front lines of sustainable architecture and urbanism. My name is Nirmal Kishnani. I'm a sustainable design strategist, author, and educator based in Singapore. We equate greenery on buildings with sustainable design. If a project has green walls or green roofs, it must be doing something for the environment, right? Well, maybe. Small buildings around the world embrace this approach. We must challenge assumptions and ask hard questions. For instance, what are the costs and trade-offs? What's the upside and downside? Can we separate what works in the tropics from what's right for London or Johannesburg? My guest today, Leonard Ng, is a landscape architect with the Singapore office of Henning Larson, where he is regional director for the Asia Pacific. He is, I think, the best person to unpack these questions, partly because he has collaborated on so many award-winning, vertically vegetated buildings, and partly because he's a hard-headed pragmatist. To Leonard, greenery on buildings is a means to an end. So I'll ask him, what should be the goal here? And what are the steps to getting it done? We'll find out in a moment. A quick reminder before we start, you can get more out of this episode on our website at ecogradia.com, where you'll find curated images and notes that back up what's being discussed today. And please, if you like what you hear, click the subscribe button on this screen to know first when a new video is out. Your support matters a lot and helps this channel grow better and stronger. And now, Leonard Ng. Leonard Ng. Welcome to Ecogradia. Thanks, uh, Normal. Always nice to see you. So here is a statement that I often hear these days. The more plants we put in, on yeah. and within a building, the more sustainable is the development. I personally, I think this quantitative approach where, you know, more is more is nonsense. Do you agree? I think we need to be honest about why we're doing green walls and vertical greeneries. I happen to think that they, they perform different functions it is okay to do green walls or, or, or vertical greenery for aesthetic, purely aesthetic reasons. But you must be honest with yourself, right? Similarly, if you want to uh, sell your uh, sustainable credentials, then you have to make sure that the green walls that you install are performative in nature and adds value to the environment. Mm. So really, it's really about honesty. Mm. Break it down for me. What are the options when it comes to building integrated greenery? Where can you put it? Well, I think let's take a step back, right, and talk about the, the whole purpose of a vertical greenery, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you allow me to just uh, explain the context of how this came about, right? Sure. It came about yeah. because of climate change, th thermal comfort, and the fact that we are growing our cities, right? And when we grow cities, we remove environment for vegetation. Right? We have basically changed our mind. So, you know, uh, I think out of uh, uh, good intentions, right, the planners and, and the uh, designers were thinking, well, how can we provide spaces for nature? Mm. So I think the original intention was good, all right? But maybe the, the, the reasoning has been uh, uh, lost through time. And the application maybe has really missed this big picture, right? So uh, providing spaces for greenery, has now become uh, more fashionable on buildings, 
right? Green replacement is a big topic, right? So the question is, how do we and when do we do this? Uh, and 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 this is something that you know needs careful thought before uh, solutions are provided. I I see greenery um, integrated into buildings in two very distinct ways. First, there is the envelope driven approach where we see vegetated facades or roofs. Um, then there is the one which depends on architectural form, where the building itself kind of wraps around or adjusts itself or creates porosities, where you get terraces and you get atria and you get sky decks. I suspect the first approach has to do with maybe ticking the boxes. You know, mm. they're trying to achieve certain plot ratios. Uh, yeah, trying to score some points with some of these uh, you know, like awards, like Green Mark Awards, and try to achieve a certain ratio of greenery versus a uh, built environment. Uh, and the easiest way is, of course, to you know, to green the vertical surfaces because this 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 is the uh, the surface that is most available for extension of the greenery. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other typology you mentioned uh, more relates to really the, the the imagination of a designer right, or an architect who is trying to create interesting spaces, spaces uh, uh, so that uh, the buildings would have a different experience. And that tend to lead to this kind, uh, this juxtaposition of different um, green solutions, right? Uh, green facade solutions all throughout the landscape. And I think they both have a role. I, mm. if, you, if your start point is, how do I achieve certain KPIs, uh, if, be it to improve biodiversity, right? Or to reduce the temperature on the surface of the concrete mm. slab, right? Then uh, I, the, the, the solutions become a lot more specific. Let's uh, uh, list some of these KPIs, shall we? Um, I think it's it's worth kind of um, going through them one by one, and and I'd love to get your take on it. So let's let's start with the first one, which is yep. that um, you know greenery on facades uh, or even uh, within the fabric of the building have an impact on um, cooling or energy demand, right? <laughs> Uh, we haven't specifically measured the energy demands, but what we have measured is the difference in the temperature on the surface of the uh, concrete slab. Mm. So, for example, in our project in uh, Kampong Admiralty, mm. uh, we had uh, we had pre-construction and post-construction studies on the bare roof, right? Uh, so, pre-construction before we installed the green roof, mm-hmm. on a really hot sunny day, it was uh, 52 degrees thereabouts, mm. right? But once the green roof came in. It was in a region of 30 degrees, 28 degrees. Right, It's right. substantial. Imagine the difference of 22 degrees mm. and how it would impact on the heat that's embodied within the concrete slab that can be transferred down into the spaces below. To me itself, that would uh, translate into a substantial reduction in, in cooling load. Mm. So that's one very clear uh, measurable KPI. Mm. This is one aspect of this. The other is uh, what is often referred to as um, the biophilic aspect of what greenery does. So the aesthetic of greenery on facades improves psychological well-being of occupants or anybody who comes into context. Is there... A di- you know, is there an idea of what this direct impact looks like and how much it is? And how do we know that it's happening? We actually have data on this. Once again, it's Kampo Emeraldi. Mm. Instead of having bare concrete roof, why not have beautiful green terrace, uh, 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 sky rise greenery? Mm. And uh, we need to justify that it worked. So there was a uh, post-construction uh, survey done by a third party, right? Mm. Uh Measuring the change in biodiversity, mm. right? Uh, pre and post construction. So mm. what they did was, for reference, they went to a nearby pocket park and mm. measured the biodiversity there, right? Mm. And they did the same for the uh, for this park that is actually elevated between six to ten stories above ground level, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Built on an um, integrated hub. And they found that the bars, the uh, the uh, the numbers were similar. Mm. 
And uh, I think that's only possible because, you know, it was planned at the start, right? Mm. We, we looked at the strategy of uh, having a biodiverse plant palette uh, that mm. uh, helped to attract a different uh, range of wildlife, right? Mm. Providing spaces for food, for, uh, uh, for refuge, all right? And, and for, for them to propagate, right? But this needs to be done at the start in conjunction with all the other designers, architects mm. and engineers so that the, uh, the, the design becomes integrated, mm. right? Uh, and, and not just as an add-on at the end of the design mm. phase. Maybe if you could describe the project uh, a little bit uh, physically, what does it look like? Um, just so I get a mental image of what is Kampong Admiralty. What is the programmatic mix and how big is the building? It, it, it has got a large sort of a fat podium area, right? A squarish, uh, which is tiered, terraced on, on one side. So it feels like a cutout, right? And mm. at the base of the cutout is two tower blocks. Mm. They is supposed to meet house um, uh, senior citizens with, um, uh, that is, uh, with mo- mobility challenges. Right, mm. so it it had to, had to be really uh, um, accessible for these people, right? Mm. And they wanted to make this terrace uh, roof into a beautiful hillside-like landscape, right? And mm. our or- original concept was to why not create a, a landscape that uh, changes uh, with seasonal colors, which mm. is not easy to do in Singapore because we are right. tropical weather, right? right. Uh, and then to hide all the roof lines, right? And the and, uh, terraces so that you feel like you're actually looking into a hillside, mm-hmm. right? And then at the same time, have this entire built-up area collect the storm water, mm-hmm. right? Uh, collect them, detain them, clean them, recirculate them for uh, irrigation, before it is uh, the water is used to beautify and animate the spaces throughout the entire development. Mm. Uh, and I think that's why it's been so well received by the public because uh, it, we have managed to integrate seamlessly the architecture with the landscape and the water, mm. right? All in one cohesive typology and allowing the... Uh, members of the public, right, to enjoy a space that doesn't quite feel like your typical public housing, mm. right? It feels special. So you've got the, the ecological story, uh, yes. which is about how it attracts biodiversity. You've got the water story, which is how it manages water flows and recirculation. It's got the social public space story of how it brings, you know, pleasure or well-being to the occupants. And we were fortunate that the client was looking for an innovative design, right? Mm. They were looking to, uh, for us to create a new typology that would uh, be the future for uh, public housing in Singapore. Mm. We had KPIs for water recirculation, cleansing and detention. We had KPIs for biodiversity, right? Number of native species, number of fruit producing species, number of uh, color species, you know, for butterflies and uh, we, we had target species that we were trying to attract, right? And then finally, there was the uh, the social aspects, the social KPIs. We wanted to, you know, create spaces, certain sort of spaces for the user, different user groups, right? For the seniors that live there and for the grandkids that came, come to visit on a daily basis, mm. right? We created an urban garden at the top Right to engage the seniors, forcing them to walk up this ramp of stairs for that, so that they get their prerequisite exercise on a daily basis. So all these are actually set up at the start, and everybody worked towards achieving this objective. If that's a project that epitomizes success, can you think of one that does not? There are a lot of projects out there that really can do a lot better, in my opinion. Uh, we have heard of many failed projects, right? Some of them very highly visible. One that, uh, you know, I've read about is this project called uh, Paradise Park Children's Centre in Islington, London, mm. right? Where uh, because of a failure in uh, uh, the irrigation system, the, the entire green wall failed, right? Mm. Uh, over a course of a very short period of time. And, you know, the thing about green walls is they tend to be located or positioned in the most 
obvious spaces because they're green walls. They're supposed to be showcased. So when it fails, it's an absolute disaster, right? It's an eyesore. It becomes extremely visible. So Mm. the thing about designing for landscape is it's not a static design. It's a dynamic design. Mm. But designing for nature, right? Unlike designing for buildings, Mm. you design for the ebb and flow of nature. Nature changes through time. Right. 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 So how do you define success in such a dynamic situation? Right. Right. Do you define success in one point in time or do you see it through a range of environmental conditions of of seasonal changes? Think, Think about it. Uh, in in the context of uh, uh, the old Victorian houses, right, covered by this beautiful ivy in the summer, green that turns this large red in autumn, beautiful. And then in winter, everything drops and you see this brown. Is it a failure? I think, you know, Mm. it is relative. We need to understand designing for nature is not like designing for a building, which is a static design. Right. right, and and the way we measure success of nature would have to take this dynamic consideration in our equation. Right, that's a that's a really interesting point that you're designing for a set of conditions observable over time rather than an end outcome. When you're designing vegetation or natural systems. Uh, it cannot be evaluated in a static way. It has to be seen as a dynamic system. Uh, and there is an ebb and flow. This point lost in many of our design discussions, right, with our partners. Mm. Uh, because at the act of selling on community and design tend to be very uh, accommodated in a snapshot manner. Yes. Right? You notice how renderings are produced. <laughs> the, the renderings are of a single point in time, right, by nature. Yeah. right, And that's how designs are sold. But as landscape architects, actually, when I do my design, I'm not actually designed for the moment it opens. Mm. I'm designing for 10 years hence or 15 years hence when when, when uh, then the trees and the plants and the ecosystem has matured and found a balance. Mm. And that is a, a, a significant difference. That's a really useful way of thinking about it that you have to see this as not a scenario, but multiple scenarios over time, right? Yes. Yeah. It's a good way of putting it, yeah. You've done a great job explaining the upside. Um, And I think a lot of uh, consultants and developers uh, also have to wrestle with the downside. The first is the idea that it costs more. Does it cost more? And if so, how much? There is, uh, well, compared to a building with no uh, greenery, yes, it does cost more, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, but I think if it's done in a sensitive manner, right, in a manner that uh, uh, takes into consideration the needs and the user groups, it, the benefits more than always the cost, right? Mm. Uh, but as you're trying to imply, it's not always the case. Mm. A lot of times it's not done well, mm. right? Uh, and and, and uh, where it fails, it can fail at multiple points and therein lies the problem. How do we measure the trade-offs in cost? Because... Very often, a project does uh, brings greenery that benefits the neighborhood, right, or benefits the city, right. How you know? How do we assess this? Because it's uh, one party spends the money and another party benefits. Right. Uh, there are a few um, stakeholders in uh, always multiple stakeholders involved in this development, right? Uh, so take the example. Uh, of uh, developing a park, there's uh, there's always this same question: Why do we spend money developing parks? Mm. What's the justification, right? Uh, so, uh, a, a, a example that is close to us is, is Bishan Park, something we have done mm. uh, as one of our first projects in Singapore. How do you justify the the money of tearing the entire canal out and making it into a natural river, right? Uh, and and really. Uh, Studies has been done post construction, right? Measuring health outcomes, mm-hmm. right? Uh, measuring, uh, getting people's feedback about how they feel, how often they use the park, what's the number of visitors, right? The number of people exercising. These are all anecdotal evidence, right? That having uh, this kind of green solutions, right, does have a um, 
uh, benefit to the users. Mm. Uh, in 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 the case of uh, Skyrise Greenery, uh, you can measure the outcomes by uh, by looking at the bar of D and how it improve uh, the uh, moods of the people. Right, mm. uh, because it is a senior citizen uh, um, facility, mm. right? Uh, the health outcomes can be quite uh, drastic. Mm. But both projects that you mentioned are, are publicly funded, right? I mean, uh, yeah. there and the, and there is therein a uh, direct relationship between uh, the spending of the money and the beneficiaries. So, public money for public good, right? Um, right. Do you think? provocation. Do you think that public money should subsidize greenery in private developments where it benefits the city? Wow, that is a provocative question. Uh, I I think uh, they have both their individual roles, right? I don't, okay, let me, let me take a firm stand on this. I don't believe that public money should be used to subsidize private developments. I believe private developments have their own justification to why they should incorporate greenery. And it's obvious, right? There is financial benefits to incorporating greenery within developments. It is clear. That's why all developers are doing it, right? That's why when you open the paper and you look at a condo development, the first thing they sell is the greenery, the pool area, the beautiful landscape. Mm. That, that is obvious. So I think they are complementary. They both play their roles. But just just to just to push that point a little further, I mean, a lot of the greenery that we see in private developments is designed purely from a biophilic standpoint, meaning you know it's 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 meant to benefit the occupants or the users of that space, you know, either as an amenity or as a or as, or as a as a as a as an experience of proximity to nature. But if you're going to shift to a biocentric view of the city. Right. If you're beginning to argue that the project needs to participate in the creation of habitats or ecosystem services, then that's not in the developer's interest, not in the direct developer's interest. That's in the interest of the city. Right. So how do we transition from biophilic thinking, which is, um, you know, which has a direct cause effect on, on the occupants or the investor to one in which the city benefits? Right. Actually, uh, we have been involved in quite a few projects where mm. there has been close collaboration between private developers and uh, public agencies, mm. right? Where private agencies set the framework for design and mm. provide guidelines, right? And the private developers uh, take this and work with the agencies to make sure there's full integration, whether it be stormwater or visual integration or using the same plant palette so that, you know, nature can move seamlessly from uh, private to public. Mm. Uh, and this is really happening because it's a win-win situation on both sides. It's, it's not like, I, I, I don't do this because it doesn't benefit me. Mm. Actually, a bit increasingly, the partnership is seen as a mutually beneficial. And mm. I, I see that in many of the projects where they work with each other to achieve a common outcome. Mm. Um, we just have to do more of it, right? And we have to go deeper, right? And be more extensive with what we do. You are, of course, um, referring to projects in Singapore where there is this yes. kind of very uh, explicit collaboration between uh, private developers and public agencies. Do you think that this lesson translates to other parts of Asia or other parts of the world? Not always. Right, uh, there are parts of the world that's really doing this. They're pushing the boundaries, right? Uh, but there are parts of the world there's no communication, mm. there's no collaboration, mm. right? Uh, and, and and you know the the problems are multidimensional and complex, right? Mm. It's got to do with politics. It's got to do with funding. It's got to do with time, right? It's got to do with stakeholders. Back to the question of uh, greenery in buildings, right? So here's another big uh, perceived problem. Uh, it's got a huge maintenance issue. So right. I have to become a lifetime gardener. <laughs> I have to, you know, the building owner or the building manager has to manage this for the right. life of the building. Otherwise, you know, that that project that you mentioned, you know, the, the death of the green wall, which becomes, you know, 
emblematic of, of everything that's wrong with that project. How do we think about this? Um, is it substantial? Um, how is it integrated into the running of the building? Right. I will start by saying that uh, I'm also guilty of this, right? When Patrick Blanc first came out with his beautiful green wall, I was enamored. I thought this was the business. We need it everywhere, <laughs> right? Uh, but in truth is, everything is contextual, mm. right? The success of the green wall, right? It actually very much dependent on the goal you set for it, mm. right? And the resources you devote to it. They must be aligned. Mm. Right, a lot of the uh, uh, people who uh, buy this idea, right, subscribe to this beautiful rendering, right, not thinking that it is a lifetime commitment. Mm. So there are many versions of green walls, right. Mm. There's the low intensity version, like the ivy growing up a Victorian house, mm. where it requires almost no maintenance, right. And then there's the super intensive, uh, you know, green wall you find on museums and public buildings that requires a lot of resources, water, uh, manpower and all that to maintain it, right? And 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 there are places, uh, there are occasions for each of this, mm. but you need to apply them correctly, mm. right? If this to wow, right? And, and to all shock and awe, then by all means. Mm. But be, be prepared to devote a lot of resources maintaining it because maintenance is expensive for intensive green wall. So you got to go in with your eyes open. Exactly, right. If if your intention is just to, hey, I need to cut down the heat here. I need to screen this place up, you know, and with very low maintenance, then you need to understand that there are the, there are more limited set of solutions. Mm. You need to mediate the outcome to reflect, you know, the resources you're prepared to commit in the future. Mm. I think this is the kind of honest and candid discussion you need to have with yourself as a designer and with your client mm. right, prior to suggesting any solutions. Mm. The failures we see are a misalignment of the, the wishes versus their uh, commitment to future resources. Right. No, I, I, I often wonder if the people that have to look after the building are at the table when these early decisions are made, right? I mean, the, the maintenance teams or the occupants who are going to become the gardeners, are they represented or are, is their point of view taken into account? Because there is very often in these projects a gap between who builds and who inherits that decision, right? Um, yeah. What's been your experience? I mean, how, well, first of all, are the maintenance teams sitting at the table? And if they're not, then how do you get their interests um, positioned clearly? This is a sensitive topic because uh, if you want my honest opinion, I think, you know, there is some conflict of interest involved in the industry when it comes to maintenance. Mm. Very often, the suppliers are also the one maintaining. Mm. Right? Because it, is a very, it requires a very specialized skill set. Right. You need somebody who is familiar with high-rise greenery, right? Uh, vertical walls, you know, with the machines required, right? And 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 typically this comes with very expensive maintenance contract. So there are many occasions where there's nobody else but the supplier who can do this, right? Mm. And I think that sometimes uh, a misalignment of what is promised versus, you know, what is delivered, right? Uh, mm. You sell a product, it says, well, this is great, this is, you know, easy to maintain. And later when you start maintaining, uh, oh, you have to replace the plants here on a regular basis. You have to do more maintenance. Uh, and, and, and this conversation has to happen early. I'm not mm. saying that, you know, there is a dishonesty here. No, it's just that it has to happen in a transparent manner so that mm. the client can evaluate the cost the life cycle cost, not the installation cost, but the life cycle cost, right, before he makes a decision. Uh, a lot of times, green walls are evaluated based on the installation cost, which misses mm. a big part of the picture. I imagine you're talking about um, a lot of these very complex, but also technological de technologically dependent solutions where there are these irrigation systems or there are these uh, particular type pallets of plants. Uh, is that the only way to do it? I mean, what, what do you do in a developing country, uh, in a country that doesn't have these 
you know, margins to build with. Is this something that can only happen in places like Singapore? I is, don't believe this, so. I, no. I mentioned there are many uh, typologies of green walls. I'm referring specifically to vertical green walls. Yes. Right? Yeah. I mean, the simplest ones is grow a creeper up a, a wall, mm. like, like ficus in Singapore, you know, up our, our um, you commonly see them on our flyovers where they grow up the pillars. Beautiful. Mm. It's a green wall, mm. right? The ivy on a Victorian building, that's a green wall. And the next stage is, you know, you grab on, on cables that's mm. connected to two points, right? Mm. That's, Oh, that's a green green facade, vertical greenery, right? Mm. And then, of course, you can install meshes with uh, 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 regular spacing of uh, planter boxes, growing up creepers, uh, uh, like very much like Osea. That's that's also vertical greenery. Then you can progress on to uh, uh, more complex systems like the uh, 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 cell systems where each individual pots carry a, a single plant, right? And then finally, to the really extensive uh, uh, natural fabric systems. Mm. Uh, so there are really gradients of green walls, right? Mm. The ones that is just growing up the creepers, those are cheap, right? And and those can do most of the job, right? It may not look as beautiful or as uh, as biodiverse, but you know it does the job of cutting down the heat, right? Mm. Greening a a, a a bare wall. Right, pro- providing visual interest, providing spaces for uh, animals to hide and coexist with us. Mm. So, and I be- believe this applic- uh, can apply to uh, um, the developing nations. Right? We have mm. not, in my opinion, explored fully the potential of even these basic typologies. But you can understand why the perception uh, might be that this is you know, the a plaything of rich countries. I mean, it is it is happening either in typologies like hotels and resorts where you see a lot of this or class A office buildings where you see this becoming a, very much a part of the branding of the project or in places like Singapore where, you know, uh, we have these kind of systems and maintenance regimes in place and, and, and uh, statutory codes. I mean, do you, uh, do you see this... Uh, in, in translating to, say, social housing or a place like India, are, are there examples that you've encountered where, you know, and I know you mentioned IV walls in the UK, but um, in high-density conditions in Asian or, you know, African or um, uh, Latin American cities which are developing and don't have the resources, do you see this idea, A, first of all, being implemented anywhere, but B, um, being practical, you know, uh, for as solutions? I think so. I, I, I do believe there is room for this kind of design, mm-hmm. uh, even, even in these developing countries. Uh, it's just, I'm not sure why it has not been uh, more widely introduced, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But if I understand the technology that's involved and the uh, amount of maintenance, it should not be difficult. Right, mm. uh, and we as designers, I think we owe it to them to actually, you know, introduce to them the potential of using this kind of solutions to really, you know, soften their 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 urban environment and uh, improve livability. Mm. If some, if a social housing um, developer in India were to come to you and say, "Help us build a green wall." Well, you know, what would you do? You have to take into consideration local expertise, the building right. capabilities, right? Construction yes. skill set, available materiality, the right. maintenance, uh, 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 education and capacity, right? The, the budget uh, for construction. It will, it will look different. It will be responsive, right? Uh, and, and as a result, you know, I think you'll be more adapted to the system. I, I'm reminded of a project um, by Rahul Mehotra, uh, who we interviewed in the podcast uh, in season one, um, it's a uh, it's an office building in in Hyderabad in India. It's called the KMC Corporate Office Headquarters, yes. I think, um, and and it's it's basically a simple um, you know um, rectilinear uh, geometric form, uh, but it's got a double skin system and it's got an outer skin that's a green wall. And uh, what what 
always stays in my mind about that project is the argument he makes for the green wall. And he says that actually what it does is that it creates employment for 20 gardeners, <laughs> you know. So wow. people, people in the community, it's not a high-tech solution as you might expect in Singapore where, you know, you've got these irrigation systems and so on. But it is a solution where um, uh, low-cost labor, uh, it, it creates employment basically for people. And, um, and, you know, he makes this very um, uh, pointed uh, note that the gardener who, who makes very little money is sitting, is separated from the executive in the meeting room by a sheet of glass and they see yeah. each other, you know, in that same space, which I thought was, um, was an interesting point to make about equity. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting to hear that, you know, one of his intentions was to create employment opportunities. Really mm -hmm. generous of him. Typically, a private developer will try to uh, look for a design that requires a minimum of uh, manpower input, right? Uh, maintenance, right. right? So it's a refreshing to see, you know, that he's actually using it as a tool, right, to engage with the community. Uh, and I think it demonstrates uh, the diversity of solutions and, and uh, uh, what it can mean for different stakeholders. Mm. Okay. I, I hear this again and again in the conversations that we're having on this podcast with, um, with different designers that um, what very often is approached as a technological solution in some countries, I suppose richer developed countries, is often seen as a social equity question in other countries that, yeah. you know, it's where labor costs are low and unemployment is problematic, that it actually is a way of putting money in people's pockets, you know. Um, uh, so it, it, it serves a different goal. I mean, it's, uh, it's, not, a, it's not a backup, but it's, it's a different point of view of, of why you do this. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Let's talk a little bit about what, what we do um, as designers at the drawing board. Tell me what it's like at, at these meetings around the table. Who drives the conversation? Is it the landscape architect or the architect? Uh, it depends on the personality involved. Right, but what I can tell you is, uh, and this is not the diplomatic response, this is the real, real response. Right, the most successful uh, uh, designs are the one that uh, allows input from everybody on the mm -hmm. table and involves everybody at the start. I think those are the most successful design because you know, uh, when you have one individual driving the design discussion, right. Uh, you are limited by his experience and his education, his background, right? But if you allow a diversity of experience and keep an open-minded uh, contribution, right, mm. then you are, you are enriching the discussion because mm. now there are many potential solutions from different expertise offering different viewpoints, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, we'll still pick one, right? But at least it is, you have explored a wider gamut of potentials, right? And you've understood from a wider uh, multidisciplinary team, is the landscape architecture profession rising up to the you know to the challenge? I mean, are landscape architects becoming trained to think about landscapes in in deeper ways than than just pretty gardens at the entrances of hotels? I mean, what's your what's your take on this? Super interesting uh, question, uh, Norma. Uh, I was uh, recently just part of a jury for the Oberlander Prize, which is mm -hmm. uh, a prize for a landscape architect to represent mm -hmm. our landscape architect uh, in the profession. And, and we actually spoke about that, right? And mm -hmm. I'll always say that, you know, uh, having in this business for 15 plus years, I've actually seen a gradual transition. Mm. Right, we used to be that person who is called in at the end of the project and says, "Where do you plant the trees?" Mm -hmm. But increasingly, right, because of climate change, right, because of uh, uh, ecological disasters, right, uh, and declining biodiversity, we have seen our role increasing. Right, uh, we had to um, contribute more regularly. So, especially for large scale projects at a master planning scale where we actually uh, have a wider influence on the outcomes, mm. right? I see ourselves taking more and more of a leadership role. Mm. At the building scale, we are still subservient, mostly subservient to the architects because, you know, it is 
first and foremost an object design, right? Mm -hmm. But there is more need for integration. So I, I see the architects, you know, reaching out and saying, okay, I understand that landscape is not just a peripheral role, right? Mm. But it can make a huge difference to how the look and feel of the architecture and the experience. Mm. So they're engaging us earlier, right? But we're still subservient, right? The form still comes from the architect and the main uh, design ideas comes from them. Uh, mm. But at a wider master planning scale, regional mm. scale, city scale, you know, uh, we are yeah, the, the profession, landscape profession is definitely stepping up. And and you think that the training of landscape architects is also shifting gears towards this new role? Yeah, you will see more and more schools responding to this, mm -hmm. right? You, you, you'll see that uh, in many schools are actually not looking at the discipline separately, mm. right? But jointly, right? Mm. Uh, and they're looking for the, the person who can bring this together. Uh, mm. So the, the question is, who is this person? Uh, I, I would like to argue that lands, landscape architects, right, as well, well positioned for this because, you know, we operate in that scale and at that realm, mm. open space, anything out in the space, right? Uh, so uh, we, we, ha we understand the disciplines enough, right, to at least know how to use them and bring them together, right? Mm. So that we can have a much richer conversation and a better design. Mm. Um, but, you know, as I said earlier on, to be successful, you need everybody to be at the table, right? Mm. You need everybody contributing to discussion and bringing the best ideas. How does one begin the process? I mean, let's say everyone is around the table. What... Um, what are the what are the early decisions that need to be made? Typically for me, the start point is really understanding the site, mm -hmm. understanding the challenges and opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the thing about designing for nature is uh, you need to create the right environment, right? It, you know, designing vertical greenery is really about designing life support systems for plants. Hmm. And all these things. It's like designing a space station, life support system. What is it that is required to keep this thing alive? Hmm. To achieve its job. Mm -hmm. Right? So, what we don't want to do is use artificial means because that's, you know, uh, it's unsustainable. Right? Mm -hmm. So, we want to understand the site as to see, you know, how to work with the site. Right? How do we, understanding light conditions, for example, that's available, understanding the wind load, uh, understanding the moisture that's available, right? And then trying to make as little change as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Using native plants that's adapted to the natural environment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then working with the architect to see how do we, and, and the engineers, to see how we can recreate this condition, right? Uh, without spending too much money uh, now and in the future. Mm. The start point is really understanding what you have to work with, mm. right? Not to, not, to have, uh, uh, not to have a preconceived idea that I want to use this plant and then mm. trying to design around this plant. That, I think that is putting the cart before the, uh, the, 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 the horse, mm. right? But understanding what is the environment, what plants fits best into this environment, what you say is absolutely right. You begin with the ecology and the geography of that place. But as you begin to build with density and you build higher, right, um, uh, the plants that would have been on that piece of land <laughs> may not be on the top of the building. I mean, I've heard many stories of plants getting dehydrated and dying on on 60-story high roof gardens. I mean, there is also um, a little bit of uh, uh, tangential thinking. You have to think Outside the site, you almost have to think about other landscapes. Yeah, totally. Uh, so you, you're trying to imagine what the condition like future when, when we, we have built these tall buildings. Mm. What's the wind speed at that height? Mm. Right? Uh, what, uh, uh, how, how often are you subject to intense sunlight? Mm. And, and these are the things you need to understand, right? Uh, even though the, the, the place doesn't exist now, you have to sort of project it forward. Visualize it, right? yes. We work with the architects, right? We work with the engineers, uh, understanding, say, for example, I want a big tree here, right? Uh, but for big trees to happen, you need a certain soil volume. And we need mm. to work with the engineers. Mm. Is it possible right, for you to uh, create create a structure that will take this load at this level? 
Um, and 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 this is only possible if the collaboration happens at the start, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so that uh, so that this can be designed into the system. There is another um, often cited concern with uh, you know, especially uh, high levels of greenery in in buildings, which is pests. Because the flip side of biophilia is biophobia. How do you deal with the idea of pests? while at the same time trying to draw in biodiversity? How do you manage that? Uh, we have been grappling with this for a while. It's an interesting evolving discussion, especially in Singapore. Mm. So the, 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 even the, the definition of pest has changed through time. Mm. All right? What was once cute otters is now increasingly considered a pest. <laughs> right, and, and, and I said it because you know, it really is a really about mindset, right? Yes. It is great to live with these cute little otters, and oh, they are playful, they are nice, until someone bites you in the butt, or someone eats your koi fish, <laughs> and then they become this monster of a pest, right? right? But think about this, right? Think about this. They are just behaving based on their instincts, right? They were here before us. Right, and this is what they do as a cause of nature. It is right. us who needs to understand the behavior. It is us who needs to really moderate our thinking, or modulate our thinking to, to to understand how we can coexist them. So instead of bitching about them eating our coins, how about building a a a a, a otter proof fence around your property? Right. So, yeah. So I, I you know this discussion has got to be holistic. Right, it's not just about us against them, right? And how we respond to them. Uh, our, our historically, when it's a problem, we get rid of the competition, right? Mm. It's in our nature, right? We get rid of anything that gets in our way, including animals. Mm. We have done that. Mm. But if you aspire to be a livable, biophilic city in balance with nature and sustainable on one planet, then you need to live with nature. And that means, right, including things that do not fit your definition of cuteness. Before we kind of wrap up, I I, I just want to talk a little bit about you and your journey. Um, um, you know, I one of the things I discovered about you, which I didn't know uh, when we first met, is that you weren't always a landscape architect. Um, in fact, you've only been a landscape architect for how many years? Um, 15, did you say? Uh, yeah, 15 plus years, yes. 15 plus years. And, but prior to that, prior to that, Leonard, you had a career in banking. You you yeah. know, you had a degree in finance and you were trading currencies and stocks and bonds. And then in 2000, in the year 2000, was it you switched to landscape design? That was quite a turnaround. Why did you do that? Oh, wow. Uh, that's a long story. But... Uh, uh, I, you know, uh, I had a pretty long career in, uh, in, uh, in finance, 15 years, right? Uh, way past normal shelf life, at least in, in my profession, which was trading, right? And uh, I couldn't see myself doing it till retirement. And I was trying to fig- figure out what can I do that will benefit uh, the wider society and not, uh, not a small group of people, you know? Mm. Uh, I mean, my previous job, it was really the plus and minus column of the ledger, right? Uh, and there was really no goodwill built into the business. And I wanted to see, uh, do something that would leave a uh, visible, make a visible difference to people's lives, right? Uh, I, I considered being an architect and that was my first choice. But uh, because of my age, right, uh, I, the, my runway was pretty short. I couldn't afford the time to become a qualified architect. So mm. uh, so I, I chose the next best thing, which was a landscape architect. Right? And luckily for me, it was also during that time where, you know, climate change, uh, discussion on climate change, biodiversity loss was really beginning to take off, right? Uh, and, and landscape went beyond just aesthetic planting, right? Uh, but really uh, uh, be- became uh, uh, performative in nature and... Mm. It's really inspiring that you you um, you had a long and successful career, and then you switched tracks and you you went into something altogether different. 
and you've gone on to do really well. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I was at two President Design Awards and, and countless other accolades in, in, in a very short amount of time. Let it, looking at the future, what gives you hope? What is really positive for me is the fact that, you know, there's a lot of awareness. There's mm -hmm. a lot of dialogue, right? People are, are trying to collaborate, right? Uh, and have a shared vision towards uh, building a sustainable, livable, livable cities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really important, all right? Uh, that step is really the uh, game changer. Previously, 10 years ago, this was not even part of the discussion, mm -hmm. right? And if you're not talking about it, you cannot be solving it, right? Mm -hmm. There's still a long way to go for us, but at least we're talking about it. We are aware of the problem. We are trying to put our heads together. Right? And hopefully, you know, uh, if uh, looking at man's track record, right, hopefully we're smart enough to get our act together in sufficient time to reverse our mistakes. Mm. Well, on that note, Leonard, uh, thank you so much for making the time today. As always, it's a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks, Normal. As usual, you know, I expected a provocative discussion and you delivered. Thank you. Thanks, Leonard. Take care. Bye. I'd also like to thank you all for tuning in. There is much more about this episode waiting to be unpacked at ikugradia.com, where you can also find all past episodes, their images and notes on dedicated pages from season one up to now. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please click the subscribe button on this page to know first when a new video is out on our channel. It means the world to us and helps us reach out to more experts and practitioners with ideas and solutions on how to make this world, buildings and cities, more sustainable on Blueprint at a time. Until we meet next, this is Nirmal Kishnani signing off in Singapore.